Colin McGovern and Scott Roush actually tied to the thousandth of a second for pole in qualifying, but McGovern was given the pole because he set the fastest lap before Roush. Both will get the bonus points for pole, but we're off to the races here as McGovern slides up to, to defend Roush, but this opens the door for Van Evenhoven in the 81 on the low side, who's going to take a look. Can't get anything done as of yet. McGovern leads lap one. McGovern held strong on the top side of the track, but Van Evenhoven finally cleared with some support and inching forward from John King as well as Jake Baskinger. Now the battle's on for second as Baskinger challenges three wide. King and McGovern rubbing doors off of turn number two. We've got a big crash back in turn four coming to the yellow. It's going to be Van Evenhoven leading it at the first caution as Baskinger gets really loose. He saw Brandon Krasta and Matthew Engelram check up right in front of him and had to take evasive action. The 33 team was on edge. DJ Curtis started this race midfield and Tony Tavolaris qualified right behind him. And he went upside down on the front straightaway after the 69 and the 66 made contact. Luckily, the rest of the field was able to get their cars woed up in time to avoid serious contact with the rolling number 33. But Curtis will retire the car from the race and will end up finishing dead last. Let's take another look at the incident. Yet again, another over-exuberant move by Tony Tavolaris, who pushed it four wide where there really wasn't any room. The gap between the Curtis brothers closed up, and when it did, Sam Curtis was sent barreling up the track into his brother, who had nowhere to go but up the wall. Let's ride on board Bill Littlejohn, who was right behind the chaos and had the 33 barrel roll pretty much right next to him. Allen gets a piece, Sam Curtis sent spinning in front of the pack. Little John gets a small piece of that that shouldn't affect his performance too much, I don't think. But Al Lagacy, Williams, Brandon Krasta, uh, Tristan Wilhoyt, Robert Piet, and Matthew Engelram also got a piece. Although Tony's known for making some pretty stupid moves, and I'm sure he, that will put him in the bad books of the Curtis camp, this will bring some hope to other drivers' championship efforts, particularly Mark Hankins and Michael Harvey, who had good finishes in race one. Since Curtis will finish last, this may have just reopened the championship battle. Coming into this round, third in points, Matthew Engelram got a small piece of the collision, but while he was trying to accelerate out of it, something went wrong under the hood. He might have over-revved the engine or something before trying to change gears, and he will go out of the race as well. Two of the top three in points will finish 41st and 42nd, with Will Hoyt the only other driver to go out of the race from this accident. Van Evenhoven brings him back to the line, and he will take the high side. That opens the door for John King and Colin McGovern in the number 42. It doesn't seem to be wasting any time today. He wants to lead every single lap, it looks like, as the 42 dives it up uh, the inside of the 19 before he can try and get around the 81. Van Evenhoven still holding on to the high side, but Mitchell Carter has now joined the fray, pushing McGovern to the mid lane where there's not a whole lot of grip to be had and no, not a whole lot of room to work with. The number 80 Lithia machine was in victory lane earlier on this season at a short track, so it wouldn't be terribly surprising to see him compete for the win yet again here. Jake Baskinger forces McGovern back into the middle as he goes for second position. Despite the three wide racing behind him, Carter can't seem to get into a rhythm and he's running up the cushion at the very outside of the track and he's not pulling away as a result. Jake Baskinger with a big lunge to the inside, the number 10 Napa machine going to the front of the field. He started this race seventh in points, so this could be a monumental day for him if he can get it done and he might just be right back in the points race. Colin McGovern challenging down low, Van Evenhoven stuffs it up through the middle with the 81 machine. Behind him, John King gets turned around by John Bonnell. The 19 spins the car and we're gonna end up racing back to the yellow as a result. McGovern has that car hooked up at the bottom of the track, manages to sweep around Van Evenhoven and Baskinger, but slides up, exiting the corner, coming to the yellow, very close between the 81 and the 42, but McGovern will hold on and the field 
has to slow down in a real hurry to avoid the tail half of the field. John King was up at the top side of the track, but it looks like he was trying to come down, and John Bunnell gave him absolutely no slack. The 19 sent into the inside wall. Not a whole lot of damage to the discount tire machine, and unlike last time out at Phoenix, he will be able to continue. Henry Williams loses a lap under caution as the crew has to solve an electrical issue under the hood. Without some high attrition, things are not looking good for the 8HW today. McGovern gets a good jump on the rest of the field on the restart and pulls away by around three or four car lengths. The battle is now on for second, it looks like. Bassinger challenging the 81 up the inside. The battle for second has become the battle for the lead. Van Evenhoven pulled up to the 42 throughout the racing with the number 10, and as a result, Baskinger is now going for the race lead after finally clearing Van Evenhoven, who appears really strong on the top side of the track. Close quarters racing between Jerry Guerra, Tommy Turbo, and Tony Green. These three drivers are currently mired in the mid-20s on track. It's not looking too good for Tony Green to finally get that first top 10 on the year. He's had a lot of runs where it looks like he could have one, but uh, so, so far, nothing better than a 15th place effort for him. Hopefully, before the year is out, kids will eat free at Golden Corral. Zachary Fitzwater Sr. pinned to the low side of the track. He squeezes up against the 03 and the 23, heading into turn one. He started 24th, but has already cracked the top 15 in this first quarter of the race. He's going up against Mike Viznovsky, another short track winner, and John King, who's holding on surprisingly strong despite his front end damage. Van Evenhoven and Baskinger traded the lead again, but it's McGovern with the last laugh as he would slip back to the front up the inside. Now they're three wide for the lead as Van Evenhoven looks a little unsteady in that midline and Baskinger tries to hold it once again. It would take some effort, but Baskinger would go back to the front as Bunnell and Torres begin to join this mix. Van Evenhoven again stuffs his nose three wide. Sebastian Torres makes it nearly four wide heading into turns three and four. A little bit of bumping between the 53, the 81, and the 10, and the 68 wisely backs out for now. John Bunnell is the new race leader. Fans treated to yet more hard racing as the 81 bounces off of the 53 coming onto the back straight. That's going to leave the door open for Colombian Sebastian Torres to race for the lead at the bottom of the track in the unlikeliest of places. Torres has yet to get his first career win. He was robbed back at New Hampshire last year after contact with the lap car of William Duncan. Caden Van Evenhoven must have a fanny pack to carry the kind of balls that he has out there today. Constantly running it three wide for, for the middle, running up at the top side, and just overall giving it all he's got. Scott Roush, Lucas Knight, and Alexander Rowe all bounce off one another for seventh as the Dodge Challenger team continues their charge towards the front. McGovern gets Torres back as Van Evenhoven continues to send it through the middle with reckless abandon. He seems committed to either winning or bringing back the steering wheel, which since he is currently 13th in points, nearly two rounds back of the championship lead, is a fairly valid strategy to be honest. Baskinger slide jobs in front of the 42, but Van Evenhoven and McGovern get together, nearly crashing for the lead, but luckily the caution is out to settle things out for the time being. And Tevia Kingray checks up right at the exit of the corner and gets turned around by the 35 on the front straight. Price has been racing hard, trying to get to the front to get the most points gain on this very important day. Kingray wasn't given a whole lot of slack. Like the King spin, Price kept her more or less pinned, hoping that the 03 would get it straightened out. Kingray slapped the wall lightly on the right side but shockingly enough, only lost one position in the deal since he crossed the line while spinning to take the yellow flag. Baskinger could not get a good gap on the restart, and as a result, Van Evenhoven by him one lap after they went back to green. John Bunnell would actually snap the lead away from both of these guys, while Van Evenhoven was too preoccupied with clearing the number 10. Baskinger challenges Van Evenhoven for second, but they're both catching the leader, the number 53, and would it really be a battle for the lead if the 81 wasn't diving it up the middle? 
Baskinger back to the front as now Torres races for second place. New Jerseyite Blake Camphausen now nearly inside the top five. He hasn't had a whole lot of opportunities up at the front so far this season. A best finish of eighth uh, is his pinnacle performance, and he has not led a single lap so far. Torres currently going after Baskinger. He had a little bit of trouble getting the car to stick at the bottom of the track, but it would eventually make it work, and they're now three wide behind him for second. These guys are leaving it all out there on the track today. Bunnell retakes the lead as Baskinger gets boxed in. Camphausen now has the bottom of the track, and he's three wide for the race lead. Can't quite lead the lap at the line, though. Van Evenhoven edged him out despite bumping with the 53 off the corner. They bump again, and the 81 and the 53 wash up slightly. That will leave the 441 with a lot of room to work with, and he will finally get a first lap led. The base shore heating and plumbing. 4-4-1 to the front of the field. Van Evenhoven already trying to get a run back up in the 81 as Mitchell Carter rejoins the podium. Van Evenhoven continues the crossover while Mitchell Carter searches for untouched dirt at the bottom of the track just inches from the truck tires. Carter shoves the 10 to the bottom of the track. This race beginning to get a bit physical as we hit the halfway mark. Van Evenhoven still trying his best on the top side of the track. And how about Camphausen being surprisingly brave for someone who just led his first lap there as he shoved his nose between the 53 and the 81. Now three wide for the lead. The 53, the 10, and the 80. Camphausen takes advantage of them checking each other up with a gutsy move on the inside. Four wide through turn one they were. But it's going to work out for him as Bunnell and Passenger get together through turns three and four. Camphausen secures that lead with the 4-4-1. And Benoit Lefer Irvine, Irvine justifiably just laying back behind these guys to give them some time to sort it out. Van Evenhoven would snap the lead away, but a challenge from Carter leaves the two of them vulnerable for the number 53 who scoots back past. Teammates and brothers, the Greens battle for the 15th spot. This could be one of their best overall weekends if they can keep this up, but they're creating a roadblock that is stacking up the drivers behind them and have lost the group in front of them as a result. Grayson Acevedo has had a rough time more or less ever since his wall a win at Waltham. He really struggled at the road courses, but it does seem he's gotten the hang of this short track as he continues to make his way forward. Brunus Littlejohn is right there as well. The Littlejohns have been looking forward to this race and both felt that they had good chances after getting really comfortable in practice, but neither are running as strongly as you would expect. Bill is struggling in the mid-20s and Prudy is still trying to crack the top 15. With Curtis out of the race, it's particularly critical that Prudy cuts the points lead down as much as she can with a good finish here. Van Evenhoven is one of the hardest drivers to pass from the lead. He's led for the last eight times around, but new challengers seem to have something to say about it. Camphausen, Alexander Rowe, and Zachary Fitzwater Sr. have now entered the top five as we get into the final 50 laps of this race. Two damaged cars, Sam Curtis and Andreas Allen, are going a lap down now. John Bunnell got to them first and slips to the inside line, getting by them quite easily. Van Evenhoven uses lap cars as a pick to ensure that he clears the number 36 of Alexander Rowe. Rowe looks to the top side of the track, but he has nowhere to go. He's pinned in by Blake Camphausen, and he has nothing to do but wait. The 01 of Al Lagasse blows up from the 36th place position and brings the Duluth machine to a halt off the racing line in turn number one. He was already well off the pace and set to be the next car lapped, but at that point, that's just salt in the wound, and this has become a bit of a theme for Al Lagasse throughout this season. Lagasse's stop car would draw a quick caution, and on the way back to take that yellow, Tony Green would get into the back of Scott Roush. Quite a bit of damage to the front and left side of the 696 Durex machine. Camphausen would bring the field back to the green. He would get a pretty good start, but within just two laps, he was run down and overtaken by Van Evenhoven. Scott Roush has some trouble getting going on the restart. He might be now down on power after his most recent incident, 
and John King dove to the bottom of the track and overtook him before the start finish line. It was an unfortunate situation, but the rules are clear on this. John King will have to serve a stop and go penalty. Irving now in the picture in the Cronenberg number 15. His teammate Aiden Shepard managed to get his first top 10 of the season in race number one. And Irving seems to have the same pace. Takes the lead down the back straight away. The 42 challenging up the inside. Irving in the 81 make contact both of them hard into the wall off of turn number four. But they somehow keep going. McGovern sent it in pretty hard. The 15 was in a tight spot but gunned it to try and get ahead of the 81 who stubbornly kept his nose there at the outside. Once they made contact, neither was going to make corner exit even though, though they got unlatched before hitting the wall. The 15, despite getting tossed around like a toy car, maintains control and keeps going despite the obvious damage. I have a hard time believing that that car could still compete for the win though. One more angle of the incident is Camphausen also got a piece of that after the 15 came flying back onto the circuit. That will give the 42 a big lead as the entire pack behind the 15 pretty much went into a panic mess. Zachary Fitzwater Sr. and Alexander Rowe led the charge back up towards Colin McGovern and through the lap traffic of Scott Roush and John King they closed the gap and got to his back bumper. Almost immediately the 59 lunged for the lead, but Alexander Rowe would get the better of his competitors, courtesy of the inside line. Sylvain Lesavage and Jerry Guerra now in the picture with just 20 laps to go. Good to see the 71 competing for a podium after his terrifying roll over the pit wall just two rounds ago. And only time will tell whether Lesavage can actually close one of these things out. He's been very close on a couple of occasions, but still hasn't been able to get the W. The pole sitter, Colin McGovern, returns to his starting spot. He set the fastest lap of the race as well, but the second fastest lap was set by the guy challenging him now, John Bunnell, who quickly gets the lead for himself. Scott Roush is about to go a second lap down just 15 laps after his first time encountering the leaders, but they might have a bit of trouble getting around him in the current gaggle. Bunnell has to give up track position as the 88 and the 36 continue their race for the lead. After a long struggle between the 88 and the 36, the 42 shoved the 88 past so that he can challenge for the top spot himself. But the cycle would continue as Rowe moves back to the bottom and he would eventually challenge for the lead and get it back himself. Taking a look further back, despite being undamaged, Ike Durbin will not even come close to improving his season best 10th place finish as he continues to race for 25th spot with Lucas Knight. Despite driving with the same equipment as his teammate Lasavage, Lucas doesn't seem to have anything for these guys today. Jones and King Ray are also having a rough day. Well, Demir Bejenov can't seem to get back into a rhythm as he continues his fall from the top of the point standings that's become so ordinary for him the last few seasons. Bill Littlejohn, despite very little visible damage, has had some trouble with engine performance since the crash he was involved in earlier on. Way behind these guys, predictably, is Tony Tavolaris, who will likely become the latest threat to go one lap down. Three wide for the lead, seven laps to go. The dodge of Sylvain Lasavage stuck between the Fords of the number 36 and the number 59, and none of those top three probably would have been considered serious contenders at the halfway mark. This could be the first wins for Alexander Rowe or Sylvain Lasavage, while well, Zachary Fitzwater Sr. goes for his second in seven races and his first at the short tracks. But here comes one of the more dominant cars of the day, John Bunnell. In the notably quirky green and pink number 53, he will head back to the front of the pack. Tony Tavolaris and Scott Roush may directly influence the outcome of this race. Their lap times indicate that the leaders will catch them on the final two laps. Bunnell finally clears the number 88 and the number 36. Watch out for Colin McGovern, who's re-entered the top five and has the inside all to himself as he goes after Zachary Fitzwater Sr. Sylvain Lasavage re-challenges John Bunnell as the, sh as the shuffle continues to rotate. Coming to just a few laps to go now, but the caution's out. There was a crash earlier on this lap on the front straightaway, and Sylvain Lasavage will lead them to the yellow. 
John King is trying to let the lead lap cars through. Irving tries to go around the outside, but Viznovsky impatiently looks to the bottom. King looks to try and get out of the way, but the 15's still there. And King gets sent around after they lock together in a remarkably similar manner to Irving's crash earlier on. Matt McIntyre is the only other car to get a piece, and King quickly saves the car. But that will bring out a yellow flag with just three laps to go. We're going to a green-white checkered. Two laps, just a single mile to decide the victory at Devil's Bowl Speedway. This should be a doozy. It's Hark's first green white checkered since Jennerstown for round four, and it's Quebec native Le Sauvage in the defensive coming to the green. Bunnell matches his run into turn one, but can't keep the momentum through the center of the corner. Le Sauvage slides up to protect, but that opens the door wide open for McGovern and Fitzwater Sr. Almost the entire field three wide through turns three and four. Bunnell tries to squeeze down, but when Price bump up the track into him, sending Le Sauvage into McGovern at the white flag. They crash further back as well, but it's a race back to the start finish line. Price still dealing with Rowe for second, but he's got to run on Fitzwater into the final corner. Price sends it in as hard as he can, but Fitzwater has a better run off the corner. And in a virtual dead heat at the line, officially it's Zachary Fitzwater Sr. getting his second win of the year by the slimmest of margins. Amazingly, for the second time this season, just one one thousandth of a second was the margin at the line and at an equally shocking venue as Malaga. This camera was angled slightly back towards turn four, so this actually extrapolates the distance between the 59 and the 35 as they cross the line. A physical margin of victory is estimated at slightly under two inches, give or take an inch, making this possibly the closest in Hark's history. Let's review some of the other events of the final two laps. Bunnell squeezed up into the 88. Something like that was bound to happen with the field so tight in the final laps. An awesome recovery by McGovern to regain control so quickly. Irving has yet another incident in turn four after close racing with Prudence Littlejohn sends Shelley down the track into Viznovsky. An epic save by the number 12 there as he continues on unscathed. Little John and Durbin around as well, and Lucas Knight gets a small piece, as the rest of the field is forced to patiently wait for the wreck to clear in order to keep going. Brock and Baskinger got together as they tried to get one last spot coming to the line. Torres got spun out into Green and Brock, and the three of them collect Mitchell Carter as they spear off into the wall down in turn one after the flag. What an unexpected win by the Australian. He never seems to win one of these things in a boring fashion. Price came out of nowhere to nearly get his third win of the season and second in a row, but has to settle for second, but still gets a massive points gain on DJ Curtis. Alexander Rowe finishes out with a podium with Caden Van Evenhoven climbing to fourth in the chaos after falling out of the hunt for a race win from his crash with Irvine. Bunnell still managed a top five after the strong performance he put forth today. Tommy Turbo, a quiet and unexpected sixth place effort. Acevedo gets seventh, the best he's had in a long time. AJ Green with a solid eighth in front of Torres and Baskinger to round out the top ten. You got a feel for Colin McGovern. He did everything right today, grabbing the pole, leading the most laps, setting the fastest lap, but falls all the way to 16th after spinning in the green-white checkered in an incident he had no control over. Curtis's early flip was nothing short of mercy for his championship contenders. He still holds the points lead, but the other members of the top five are within a round's worth of points. Curtis is still the odds-on favorite to win the championship, and the other drivers still have work to do. But this may have given them some much-needed hope heading into the final four rounds. Taylor Price nearly matched Curtis's win count today. He has been on a heck of a tear the last few rounds and now sits second in points. Hurricane Harvey swirls up to third, Sang sits fourth despite a mediocre finish, and Mark Hankins leaps to fifth after the dominating 1-2 finish his team had in race one. Baskinger and Van Evenhoven also saw big gains today, while Johnson and Engelram desperately need to get back into a good rhythm in order to have any chance of contending for this thing. Curtis's last place finish means that surprisingly few drivers were eliminated from contention this round. Mathematically, the top 65 still have a shot. Tavalaris holds effectively a full round disadvantage over the other participants at the bottom of the charts. Round 19 will bring the series to a staple on the Hark schedule, the high-banked, two-thirds-of-a-mile Grand Detour Raceway in Southern Illinois. 
Unfortunately for Curtis's rivals, this track is noted for its high unpredictability and the potential for a lot of attrition. Unfortunately for his rivals, DJ Curtis won on his only prior visit to the Oval in fairly dominating fashion.